Um... Welcome, fellow Storm Riders. You're officially a rider on the Hypnotic Storm. This is session 55 of Brain Software with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. He's ready for Christmas, has a new favorite delivery mechanism for context-free humor, and has done his final hypnosis show for 2014. Please welcome to the center of the virtual hypnotic octagon, Mike Mandel. Yes, Christopher, here we go again. And this podcast is a lively one. We have a lot of interesting information for you, and we especially are looking forward to one of the things that Chris has addressed already in the intro. Now, yes, let's look at all of these very briefly. I am ready for Christmas. My shopping has been done for some time now, which ought to let all of you know that I am not Jewish, despite the (laughs) The confusion (laughs) on this. Also, um, what was the second one? Oh, yes. Oh, what was the second one? The context-free humor. We're going to be spending considerable amount of time on that. You are blessed to be listening to this podcast because you are in the inner circle, the very first people to apprehend this brilliant new form of comedy that only people, he's laughing already, (laughs) only people listening to our podcast or who check on our website will have a clue as to what it is. Because we'll detail it. We'll detail it. And just, just, this is going to be something, let's say that later in the podcast, we'll tell you, you can use on your friends, you can use on people around you. And it's thoroughly enjoyable to see the bafflement and the consternation on their faces. Now, the third point was, I've done my final hypnosis show for 2014. And yes, what a Chris, show it was. What a show it was. Well, after, what, two years of talking about arranging a big group of our um, students to come out and see the show. We, we got three of them together. We made it happen. I think we had about 25 yeah. total students in and around the Toronto area who came out to see your stage hypnosis show. It was fantastic. So much fun. And great because everyone who's learned this stuff in the classroom has now watched you apply it, and they are able to understand the mechanics and the dynamics and all of the ways that it works with the rest of the audience essentially you know, thinking you haven't started yet. Well, that's right. The rest of the audience isn't catching it. They just it might as well have been sipping from the lavender bag, as it were, Chris. Yes, it, that's but right. our students watch the show, and they see the structure. They see the yes sets, the compliance sets, the formulation of heteroaction and homoaction and so on, and they know that hypnosis has a structure. So it's always a blast to do a show with hypnotists in the audience who really know what's going on. Yes, it is. So, all right, let's begin. And before we get into our context for humor, let's start with some hypnosis in the news. And over the last, I think it was over the last week or two, there was this article and a video, an accompanying video from security footage. It, uh, I believe it was in the UK somewhere and a liquor store and a a fellow walks into the liquor store and seems to be happy. There's no audio, so you, you have to imagine what you think might have been happening, which means yeah. you're making it up. Anyway, this uh, <laughs> young man apparently approaches the owner of the liquor store and seems to engage him in some sort of con- uh, conversation, right. taps him on the shoulder, gestures towards the belly region, and then the guy sort of seems the owner of the store, I suppose, not the so-called hypnotist thief. But the owner of the liquor store is standing there frozen, it seems, not really moving. And I assume he has his eyes closed, his back's to us, so he can't tell. But the thief seems to, at some point, reach into his pocket, pull out a big wad of money, and walk out. About four seconds later, the liquor store owner awakens from this frozen state. Emerges from his triumph. And immediately realizes something has gone wrong and goes to chase the guy. But it was probably not even four seconds of a delay. But it was enough for the guy to get away. And so this made the rounds of Google. Oh, hypnosis in the news. A hypnotic Mm -hmm. thief is robbing people, putting them in trances. My gut sense, Chris, is that there's a lot here we didn't see or hear. Mm -hmm. Uh, He may have been saying to him, I have a gun in my pocket out of sight. Don't follow me. We don't know. We don't know anything. I I watched the video. I found it inconclusive. Um, There was some interesting um, physical gesture, not gestures, physical touching going on. Like he was was using his fingers and touching the guy on the shoulder. (laughs) Don't touch me. He was touching the guy on the shoulder and then he was gesturing towards his own belly and then um, I think at some point pointed towards the shop owner's belly. It was, yeah, he's right saying, I have a gun. Would you prefer to be shot here in the shoulder or in your belly? I don't know. I, I, like I said, you nailed it. We, there is no audio, mm. so we really don't know. Um, I think it's extremely unlikely, uh, Darren Brown to the contrary. Remember, when you see it on a television show and see all these wild and wonderful things, you can't really be sure what's happening. When you see it mm. on a security camera... And don't even have any audio. We are we are just limited to 
guess what's going on by looking over his shoulder. It makes a great story. There's no question about yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, and, the headline, of course, you know, hypno, hypnotist robs yeah, liquor yeah. store owner. It, it's going to get a whole lot the more clicks. The only way to be sure, uh, other than interviewing the guy who I presume got away still, mm-hmm. and we, we offered to let him come on our show and, and tell us what happened. I mean, yes. we, we'll put that in the offering. And also... Uh, you hypnotists out there, maybe you should just get out and see if you can rob a couple of stores or banks and see how good your hypnosis yeah, really is. I, I mean, Kidding. You know, hypnosis or not, I'm sure it's possible for this guy to have so- done something, something weird that confused the man and then essentially took money out of his pocket and ran away. Because it really, it wasn't like the guy was standing there frozen for a long time. It was no. like, I, when I said four seconds, I was probably even wrong. It was probably two seconds. So... Is that possible? Sure. And then the guy's going, what the hell's going on? Hey, that guy just took money out of my yeah, pocket. Yeah, confused him to death. Remember, too, we, we, there may have been something beforehand. I don't mm-hmm. know if he set it up with some other test or whatever to begin to build heteroaction. I have no idea. Right. So it's a good question. It's a great story. And uh, naturally, I was kidding when I said get out there and try it. Well, yeah. Try it on your friends. <laughs> of course. Don't try it in a store. Sure, yeah. Steal their wallet and then give but it I, back to them after. Let's talk about, well, if you're giving me back, it's not stealing, but let's, we'll edit that out. Let's talk about um, context-free context humor. humor. Do you want to pre-frame what yeah. context-free humor is? Okay, again. so con- this is something I have really come to enjoy, learning this from Mike. But context-free humor is when you're saying things that don't appear to make any sense at all in the context that you're saying them. And often it's done purely for your own amusement, right. which is a wonderful thing. Right, and so, for example, like, <laughs> let's use a, let's use a, an example of past context-free humor. Uh, context for humor that we've talked about. We'd we'd refer to something like the Branson Protocol in right. class. And there is no Branson po- Protocol. I just tell everybody to get quick and get ready and quickly run the Branson Protocol. And I just go back and start doing what I was doing. And they all look at each other with blank expressions. Right. And since it no had no thing. meaning, it was right. is completely made up. Phrase. And even saying things are glanative or dursative or gavis or whatever. I mean, yeah. all of those are coin terms that mean absolutely nothing, really. But to see people's faces glaze over when we use them is quite a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Well, we've gone way beyond that now, folks. So uh, well, well, let's just boil, boiling this. it all down, though. Yeah, yeah. Context-free humor, let, let me see if you agree with this definition or not, is generally saying something that appears to not make any sense to those listening, but you're so serious about how you deliver it that right. you're, you're, you're communicating. It ruins there's, it. M- there's a meaning here. There's a message. And, and you know they're not going to get it, but you don't let on that. And, and they're wondering, what the heck is this really... What does this mean? Look, if you're going and to they're leave, just left confused. And if you're confused, and you're going to leave the podcast and just go and get some serious bleaching done. That's right, you right, know? absolutely. It doesn't make a lot of <laughs> it sense. Doesn't make any sense at all. Right, although it could. And, and so, especially if the words are chosen in such a way that there's this insinuation that it's somehow dirty or <laughs> offensive, <laughs> or like it's really hilarious. Yeah, like some when we of, say Jerry is so right about you. you. Yeah, yeah. Person, there's Jerry no, who? There's I no think Jerry. you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, remember when we were doing the email thing where we'd send bizarre emails to people? And one guy got really mad at me for doing it, remember? Yeah. He thought I was taking shots at him personally. And I said, look, this is something Chris and I have been working oh, on. Oh, yes, I remember. Podcast. He took it all weirdly. Yeah, we got... had to basically go out and prove that this was really a joke and this wasn't about him at Otherwise, all. Otherwise, it was all Mathos and Cuspicaline and he just yes. couldn't get his head around it. See, there you go. He's doing it again. He's I making know. it up. So, okay, context for humor. That's it. So, in this particular case, should I give the backstory? Sure. Not yeah. the backstory yeah. that you How wrote. How it happened. How it happened is I had received an email from somebody who I won't name. And the email was just so absurdly stupid that it really started making me wonder, you know, just how bad someone's brain function can be to write this kind of email. So I, <laughs> it was horrible. I just like, oh. I remember. It. So I get on Voxer, which is a walkie talkie app that Mike and I to use. Me. To me. Between iPhones or Android phones or whatever. Voxer, V-O-X-E-R. Look it up. It's really fun. And so I push the button to start talking to Mike, and I start ranting about this email. And I used an expression, which I won't repeat here, because it wasn't the most family-friendly. But Mike thought I said that the fellow (laughs) was drinking from the bag of Pykthos. (laughs) And I had said something entirely different, but I could see how it it sounded that way. So, So, (laughs) we laughed at the sound of this. It sounded vaguely... A Greek mythical, mythological. So I created what is really um, a backstory. Yeah, a backstory. It's Greek mythology because all Greek mythology is mythological. mythological and this anyway. is also mythological. It's just more modern Greek mythology. But it, this is an iconoplastic, a neo-iconoplastic myth. 
meaning I'm creating this, and it, there is no backstory that's real. But here's the story we created that you now need to know to use this humor on people. So listen carefully. You're going to read it? And you'll be able to read it on our website too. King Menelaus of Ithaca hired his brother, Pycthos, who was skilled in the use of herbs, poisons, and pharmacia, which of course are drugs. He filled a leather bag with various plants, including lavender and violets, and the witch Circe knitted a covering bag of the finest silver thread. The potion inside would cause abject stupidity, which was permanent, and would be given to all of Menelaus's rivals. But he feared lest Pycthos might use it on him, so he threw the bag into the fire, hoping to destroy it. Well, the leather burned away, but the silver bag remained, and the leather burning had created, created increased heat, and it had concentrated the contents into a sweet liquid redolent to the scent of violets and lavender, a single drop of which would cause permanent stupidity. So that's the backstory you know. So whenever someone's acting stupid around us and we want to tell each other or someone else in the know, like one of our storm riders out there who is you, for instance, that the person with us is acting stupidly, we just make reference to the bag of pickthos. Right. For example. Or lavender. Or lavender or violets. Violet. So you can give one. Uh, so... Your speech drips with the lavender fluid of pickthos. That's wonderful. Your speech drips with the lavender fluid of pickthos. You say that to someone and see them trying to cope with it. It sounds vaguely Shakespearean, which is nice. You can even go further and say, you have clearly, my friend, dipped your straw in the silver bag of pickthos. Right. They're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> your tongue is retolent with the odor of lavender and violets. Yes, and now you get more and more subtle. Clearly, my friend, you've drunk deeply from the lavender bag of Pycthos and moving into subtlety. Oh, the, oh, here's the, <laughs> the, the extreme subtlety. This is yours, Mike. So uh, well, let me, I'll, I'll read just, it. You okay. explain it. Did you visit the Smithsonian on your trip? That is so freaking subtle. It's hilarious. Did you visit the Smithsonian on your trip? Which is, why is this relevant? Because the Smithsonian is where? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. And what else is in Washington, D.C.? the National Art Gallery, where they also have the famed Jackson Pollock painting, Lavender Mist. <laughs> so you're making an obscure reference to lavender, implication the person's been drinking from the bag right, of Right, which is so hilarious that no one will even... Have... And then we came up with, is, is that, that your aftershave which, you're wearing? Which you use that on an email. Yeah, and you, you sniff and the air. Mike BCC'd me on this to reply to someone. Someone <laughs> sent me an email, yeah, and I just answered him, just said, is that a new aftershave you're wearing? Implication, you smell like violets and lavender. He hasn't right. got a clue. He resent his email. Or how's this one that you came up with? Have you dined with Menelaus recently? Yeah, because if you dine with Menelaus, Maybe he's he... clearly put some of the lavender and violet fluid in your food, and you're <laughs> stupid now. And I love this. This is your favorite <laughs> one here. I think I detect an Ithacan accent. Yes, when someone says something do, are, really are you stupid. Like, do, do, do I, I detect, detect a an... faint Ithacan accent? In your speech, my friend? And, and if you hang out with a bunch of friends, you arrive at a bar and they're all blasted out of their minds and roisterous and idiots. They've and all been clearly been drinking, drinking from, from the, the bag, bag of, of pick pick those. Or you just say to them, I'll deep. sit here in the Ithacan section. Yes, I'll <laughs> sit here in the Ithacan section. With so them. we urge all of our listeners, all of our storm writers to go onto the website, which will be posted with this podcast at MikeMandelHypnosis.com. Learn the, the backstory. And we're going to offer a prize. We need to think of what a prize will be. Here. We're going to offer a prize to any one of our products that you want. We'll give you free. Okay, yeah. Not our trainings, yeah. but any one of our products. Any digital navigate, download. Any digital download. You can have a single one free to the person who sends us, the reads all the backstory, and sends us the funniest or most subtle application of the bag of Pycthos. Right. An actual application, not an imaginary one. Go out and actually use it on someone. Oh, that'd in be a nice. And tell way. us the results. Yeah, you get. tell us what happens because it's going to confuse people. It's, it's, I mean, I've explained it to my wife and you've oh, explained it to it. yours. And my you know, we, we don't get your humor at all. I <laughs> sent it to Nermal Das, who's a classicist, a professor friend of mine, but he hasn't responded. I think he didn't like the backstory because it wasn't, Men Menelaus was not Ithacan. Odysseus was. Right. I think he's a purist. Right. So so we have built-in inaccuracies right. here. But, yeah, but that's right. Because that's okay. like I said, it's it's neo, neo iconoplastic. It's a new designed, newly designed one. And sometimes when someone's saying something stupid, I got one I hadn't told you, Chris. Okay, go for they, it. They say something idiotic and you just shake your head and you sigh and you say, sometimes the leather just burns away. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Okay, and then just for the spelling, P-Y-K-T-H-O-S. Pickthos. Pickthos, the bag of Pickthos. When you're referring to the Pickthosian bag. Right. 
right. of Edward so, the Confessor. So <laughs> sticking with our stupid topics here, okay. Mike, let's talk about the idea of black hat. Okay, well, this isn't stupid. This is an Edward de Bono no, it's, concept. No, when I say stupid, I mean when you are looking to be creative with people uh, and they are shutting down that creativity. they are sipping from before, the bag of pickles. Right. When you're dealing with those Ithacans. Yes. <laughs> Those Menelaean dinner compatriots. Yeah. And well, well, here's the thing. I get asked about creativity all the time because I do a keynote on it. And the corporations pay me a lot of money to teach them this. And all my storm riders in our academy know about this because you have access free to my webinar where I taught the system to you. So um, black hat is an Edward de Bono term that basically comes from his six thinking hats method of organizing your thoughts. And to black hat something, to black hat it is to shut it down to bury the idea, to not give it any chance. It's to be abjectly negative, the exact opposite of what the yellow hat is, which is sunny optimism. Black hat is pessimistic, said, pessimistic said, oh, you know, this will never work under any circumstances, whatever. There is a place for black hat thinking. And I'm saying hat, not cat. When you have designed a new product, a new idea, whatever, it's gone through the generation of ideas phase. It's been trimmed, sorted, figured out, refined, and you are about to implement it, that's when you can black hat to find ways that it could screw up and something might go, go wrong with the implementation. In other words, problem solving problem things before so, the problems Troubleshooting, yes, before they occur. When you don't want to use black hat thinking is during the green hat phase. The green hat is the create, creative hat. And this is uh, speaks of freshness of plants, seeds. The idea that one throws ideas out in the green hat phase without judging them at all, because a lot of great ideas come from stupid ideas. Stupid ideas can be reworked and lead to something brilliant, creative, and wonderful. If you black hat during the green hat phase, you are shutting down the very creativity you need. And someone I know routinely black hats any idea when it is still in the green hat phase. The um, rationale behind this, Chris, is, well, of course I'm stomping all over it. If it's not a good idea, it should be stamped out. If it's a good idea, it will be able to take it, which is idiotic because basically you're attempting to grow a plant, a firm, timberous tree, and to stomp on it while it is still in the seedling phase will even bring a giant redwood to naught. It's tantamount to sipping violets right, at the same time. Are you going to grow lavender and violets <laughs> when there's elephants not. running around Trampling in the field? Trampling through them, yeah. right. So just keep in mind, the black hat thinking is to shut down creativity. It's okay to be negative and pessimistic when you're implementing an idea to see problems in advance, but never, never shut down the creative process. You have to nurture the seeds so they grow into something useful. Right. It's, it's, I think it's interesting to note that those who are successful entrepreneurs don't tend to be the ones who get overly negative and slam ideas before you've had a chance to grow them into something wonderful. Absolutely. People who are entrepreneurs who do really well aren't afraid to dream and dream big. Mm -hmm. Imagine what's possible. Make it possible and look at the huge pictures of what you could do. In fact, one of the things we use in our hypnosis training is something called a mythos deck. And I know you're well familiar with that, Chris. A mythos More deck. More references to Greek. Oh, not even thinking. So it's clearly resonating with me at a lavender level there. What <laughs> happened with mythos cards is uh, I bought this deck and there are 55 different cards, 55 paintings, as you were, as, if you will, that are small playing card size paintings, reproductions, and they all have some archetypal, powerful image on them. And they're all completely different. One might be a unicorn lying on its side in the forest. Another might be a man firing arrows at the sun or whatever it is. And the way this works is when you have a problem or a burning question, you shuffle the mythos cards, you take one out, turn it over and stare at it, believing in advance with your intention that this is going to contain the answer to the problem or the question you're dealing with. Now, we don't for one moment mean that we are causing some sort of shift in the fabric of the universe at the level of, you know, charm quarks and strange quarks to make somehow this card match, which is what some people think. And they have clearly been drinking in Ithaca. From the <laughs> Pythosian <laughs> bag. From the Pythosian bag. What we think is happening is what most experts in the field believe by looking at the mythos card with a question strongly and intently in mind. Your brain will map across what you see on the card and somehow apply it to your problem to give you a brand new starting place and a new way of creating a wonderful solution. 
So it's an amazing way of getting the unconscious mind working and getting that ball rolling. Right. It's just a way of bringing the unconscious mind into it, right? Because if you're looking at a problem, consciously analyze it going, well, you know, how can I solve this problem? And you're not coming up with great ideas. You bring something out of left field, like a yeah. strange painting, and you go, how does this apply? Presuppose that it does, right? Right. You have to, and, go, and you can't say, well, I don't like this one. Oh, Let's try another one. That no, unicorn, no. that horn, it reminds me of the one thing I have been focusing on, and it's the wrong thing, and I need to focus on something else or whatever. Well, in right? your case, Chris, that's yeah. all strangely <laughs> applicable. <laughs> That's context-free humor right no, there. No, no, humor. It's, it's not, humor. Con, it's not Con, context-free for anyone who's listening. I'm sure if they replay it, they'll get my brilliant comedic line there. I clearly have kept the pickthosian bag at arm's on length. on one thing. So like, oh, talk man. about this. Uh, I mean, you and I were discussing when we did a live webinar today, this whole thing about the quality of a pre-frame is going to affect the quality of the work you do or yeah. the quality of your experience. I think we spent a good 10 minutes talking about this in our webinar today for our um, – our Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy students. And we do the webinars once a month and they're purely Q&A, open frame. And then, so we got onto this topic and we were talking about how some people are overly negative, let's say, and they will frame everything as it's going to be difficult or this is going to be hard. This is going to be a lot of work. It's going to take so much effort. But we need to do it anyway. And we're sort of laughing going... Yeah, why wouldn't you want to automatically hear stuff like that and program yourself to reframe it in a more useful way? And if you can, teach them how to do the same thing too. This is going to be worth all of the effort we put into it. This is going to be such an enjoyable effort. We are going to go into this with creativity in mind, and we're going to look forward to developing some incredibly useful solutions to that problem Absolutely. or whatever it is. So, yeah, let's... Like, well, I was thinking, Chris, a, a perfect example of that is if you're going in for a medical procedure. This doesn't have to be a business meeting. It can be anything. Sure. Going in for a, a medical procedure, and you're not looking forward to it because it might involve you know, wire going up the urethra or something like that, which is seldom a pleasant experience. And unless, unless, unless one is into that sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> and so um, you're going in for a medical procedure. And if the doctor says to you, okay, um, this will just take a few minutes. And uh, we've done about five of them today. Everybody's just whistled through them. It's not going to be a big deal at all. And you'll, you'll be home before you know it. Useful you go, oh, okay. If the doctor says to you, okay, I got to warn you, this is going to hurt. And if you got to scream or something, I want you to cover your mouth because you don't know what pain is yet. Now, if he said that to you... Or what if he said, this is going to hurt and I have bad news for you. We've run out of anesthetic. Oh, that's right. <laughs> now, even though they don't normally give it with yeah. a procedure, whatever this nebulous urethral procedure... Let's just procedure. paint an even worse frame. Yeah. Right. So if the doctor does the identical procedure with the two different preframes, which one would you want? You'd want the first one that minimizes discomfort, minimizes problems... And the second one does the exact opposite, even though it's the same procedure, because what people don't realize is pain and suffering are not the same thing. Two people can have identical levels of pain and completely different levels of suffering. Do somebody can that... suffer from a hangnail like you wouldn't believe, and somebody else can have their leg blown off and be thrilled that it means that they're out of the army now and they're going home. Which doctor do you think wears a lavender lab coat, Mike? You just looked at me and said, which doctor? <laughs> I'm not sure, Chris. I would say the stupid one, a lavender-colored lab. <laughs> nice Pictosian reference. I give so, you the man of a lavender award. stripe under your lab coat. <laughs> nice. So the bottom line is, whenever you have to do something, pre-frame it as useful, interesting. Say you gotta, you know, bring a bunch of people into a business meeting and deal with some really some really heavy stuff like firings or something. Mm -hmm. Do you really want to frame it as okay? We're going to have a meeting and it's probably going to turn into a slug fest because somebody's going to lose their job today. That's horrific. Whereas if you say, we're all going to get together around the table and just chat for a few minutes about a few changes that we got to make, it softens everything, mm -hmm. even though the process is the same. So find ways to make a quality pre-frame whenever you're doing anything that takes the edge off, even though the process is the same. You don't want to say it's going to be a big effort. Because there's a nonsensical mindset out there that does not deal with results. It deals with the amount of effort put in. Right. And so focus on results. Focus on what you're getting, not how hard it is to get it. Yeah. Um, an example that we talk about as well is since we've been spending quite a lot of time on the topic of wellness, both physical and mental wellness, and a big part of that is eating differently than we used to think was healthy, say, a few years ago. And... 
one of the things that we'll do is really enjoy deliciously fatty, healthy meals. And for example, omelets in the morning. And if you're going to make an omelet for yourself in the morning, it's going to take considerably more time than pouring a bowl of Cheerios or sticking some quick, Grand name, we'll edit that out. quick, uh, quick oatmeal in the, in the microwave with some water and whatever else you happen to be putting on side it. Anyway, you have to spend more time, right? Yeah. So you can frame this as, oh, it's so much more effort <laughs> to, you know, have to spend like 10 minutes making my breakfast and then I have dishes that I have to clean. And then and I got to, you know, this. And, yeah. And instead you can say to yourself, how much more enjoyable will my life be when I invest a few extra minutes in, in just preparing these healthful meals while I sit across from the counter at my children who are eating breakfast. Now I have more time to talk with them as I prepare this breakfast for right. everyone. I mean, whatever you want to say to yourself, but if you frame it as a big effort, this is going to be such an such effort. effort. Yeah. Instead of framing it as something you will enjoy, not only the process of doing, or but the result. But really enjoy. The result of having done it and what it's going to do to change your life over the long run. Investing, actually. We were just talking about Tony, Investing Ro in your Tony time. Robbins' new book, Money, what's it called? No, Money yeah, Master the Game? Money Master the Game. I've started reading it. Chris hasn't, and I, I highly recommend this book. Well, I recommended it to you. You recommend it to <laughs> I just me, haven't started reading started it yet. yet. But the thing that's great about it, you're going to like Chris. I'm going to love it. Is the way he frames everything. He frames it that you're going to make all these changes in your financial situation, this and this and this. He, he says, but... It's not difficult. It's yeah. going to be easy. It's going to be simple. It's straightforward. And you get so wound up reading. I got so wound up reading the first couple of chapters. I'm really excited to see what else he's going to say in it. Right. He's done his homework. It's it's just it's such a... If he had pre-framed it as financial information is appallingly difficult. Oh, or experts. imagine... We're going to try to dumb this down so somebody as pictosian as you can even understand it. That's you right. Know, I, I would have found it really difficult. Yeah. I mean... Can you imagine if people framed saving for your future, investing for your future as, you know, you have to make sure that that $2 a day that you were spending at Starbucks, you have to invest that. You can't enjoy the luxury of a nice cup of coffee once in a while because it's really important that you make the effort to save that money <laughs> yeah, instead. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, now you've just depressed us all. And, you know, what the hell do I want to even be around for? But why well, yeah. Not that far out. Like, well, Chris, it, yeah, it's back to things you have to do or things you get oh, to do. Oh, man. You know, do you have yeah. to do it or get to do it? If it's, oh, I have to go downstairs and do 200 Hindu squats and, you know, strengthen my heart and lungs and everything. And you say that to somebody who's paralyzed in a wheelchair and they'll say, well, it's not that right. you have to. It's that you get, get to. to. Yeah. That's it. So an it, awesome reframe. I mean, so use, we've talked about empowering questions on this podcast before. What can you do knowing what we just said? And create yourself some empowering questions that use the word like get to, a phrase like get to instead of a phrase like have to. Nice. Very nice. I mean, there's just so many things that you can do to ask yourself better questions. And in fact, it's speaking of Tony Robbins in his new book, but wasn't it him who said the quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask? Yeah, it's a wonderful, I think it's wonderful his, I think that's his line and it's a freaking awesome line. I think it is too. And it, the whole thing have to and get to is a really empowering thing. I can remember getting to a corporate show in downtown Toronto at one of the high-end hotels a number of years ago. I was tired, and I didn't feel like doing it. It was getting close to Christmas, and by the time Christmas rolls around, like now, I finished all my gigs for the year, and I yeah. sort of coast, and we do this fun stuff. And sometimes it can be a task trying to get volunteers and so on in a corporate setting if I'm doing hypnosis. And I remember sitting there and thinking, oh, okay, I've got to go on stage in an hour, and I'm here too early, and all of this stuff, and I have to do a show. And I, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wrong I state. Shook it all off and said, I get to perform on this stage at one of the best hotels in the city for an amazing corporate group that's paying me a whack of money. And I'm not a freaking telephone operator any, any, anymore making yeah. 90 bucks a week, you know. And it's, uh, I, get I get to do to. that. It's yeah. not I have to. So you shook off the lavender mist and I you did. walked away <laughs> from the violet cloud. I did, Chris. And yes. I left the bag of Edward the Confessor behind me. <laughs> I love how we brought Edward. The oh, Confessor by the way, if you've listened it. to the previous ones, I think you know it's fifty-four. About, you, yeah, I think fifty-four. We talk about the bagman of Edward the Confessor, which of course is completely made up, fraudulent, specious, and spurious. Um, if you're a guy, or if not, uh, if you see a friend come out of a public washroom or something and he's inadvertently forgot to zip up his pants, you can mm -hmm. use some context-free <laughs> humor there and just say, "Are you joining?" I perceive you're considering joining the bagman of Edward the Confessor. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so let's leave you with an empowering question. 
And uh, Okay, well, I'll do this we'll, one, Chris. Yeah, you do this one. Based on what you've heard, what will it take for you to get off your butt and start transforming your life now? And when is it going to happen? What will it take for you to get off your butt and start transforming your life now? And when is it going to happen? Thanks, everybody, for tuning in again. This has been episode 55 of Brain Software with Mike Mandel, and I'm Chris Thompson. Remember to head over to our website, MikeMandelHypnosis.com, because you will be able to opt in with your email address and get the Brain Software ebook, which is an incredible life-changing resource Mike has written. It's the same content that he delivers in keynote speeches that corporations are paying thousands of dollars to have him show up in person, and you get it for free in the form of the ebook. And if you like this podcast, please visit iTunes and leave a rating and write a review of the podcast. We want to get it out to the world. You heard me. That's right. Thanks a lot. And good, good night. night. We're the Raiders of the Ark that's lost. We're the Raiders of the Lost Ark. We are the Raiders, the Raiders of the Ark that's missing. The Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> We're the Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're the Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're the Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're the Raiders of the Lost Raiders of the Lost Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're the Raiders of the Lost Raiders of the Lost Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're the Raiders. Yes, we are the Raiders of the Lost Ark. We're the Raiders. How many people know this word?